So let's say we have this gas. And let's say in this gas we have three moles of oxygen molecules and we have seven moles of carbon dioxide molecules. And let's say the total pressure in this gas is 10 atmospheres. And we know atmospheres is just a unit of pressure. Now you might wonder, how many atmospheres of pressure does the oxygen contribute to this 10 atmospheres? And how many atmospheres of pressure does the carbon dioxide contribute to this 10 atmospheres? Well, to understand this, first we need to determine the total amount of moles in this gas. And we can see clearly we have 10 moles. 3 moles of oxygen and 7 moles of carbon dioxide gives us a total of 10 moles. Now the next step is to find the mole fraction of oxygen in this gas and the mole fraction of carbon dioxide in this gas. So the way we determine the mole fraction is to find out the number of moles you have of the gas you're interested in and divide it by the total amount of moles. For example, what is the mole fraction of oxygen? Well, we have 3 moles of oxygen and we have a total of 10 moles of gas. So 3 divided by 10 is 0.3 or 30%. So we see the mole fraction of oxygen in this gas is 0.3, which is pretty straightforward. We have a total of 10 moles and we have 3 moles of oxygen, so that gives us a mole fraction of 0.3. What about the mole fraction for carbon dioxide? Well, we have 7 moles of carbon dioxide and we have a total of 10 moles. So 7 divided by 10 is 0 0.7. So we can see we have a mole fraction of 0 0.7 for this carbon dioxide. Now an important formula to know is if you take the mole fraction of a gas and multiply it by the total pressure of that gas, that will give you the partial pressure of the gas you're interested in. For example, we know oxygen has a mole fraction of 0 0.3. And we know we have a total pressure of 10 atmospheres. So therefore, oxygen has a partial pressure of 3 atmospheres. And the same thing with carbon dioxide. We know carbon dioxide has a mole fraction of 0 0.7. And we know we have a total pressure of 10 atmospheres. So therefore, carbon dioxide has a partial pressure of 7 atmospheres. Again, if you take the mole fraction of a gas and multiply it by the total pressure, you get the partial pressure. And something important to realize is that the identity of the gas has no bearing on how these individual gas molecules influence the total pressure. For example, it doesn't matter if we have 7 moles of carbon dioxide or if we have 7 moles of this octane gas. It doesn't matter what the identity of the gas is, as long as the mole fraction is 0.7, it's going to contribute 70% to the total pressure. Also something important to realize is each gas is doing its each thing irrelevant of the other gases. For example, we know this oxygen is contributing three atmospheres to the total pressure. And even if we magically were to make the carbon dioxide disappear, this three mole of gas will still contribute three atmospheres. However, now it contributes to all the gas. However, the point is, these gases aren't influencing each other. They're each doing their own thing. And whether we have the seven moles of carbon dioxide around, or if we were to magically make it disappear, it doesn't influence what this oxygen gas is doing and how this oxygen contributes to pressure. Let's try another example. Let's say we have five moles of dinitrogen oxide gas, 12 moles of water gas, and 8 moles of xenon gas. And let's say we have a total pressure of 70 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of each of these gases? Well, the first step is to find the total amount of moles, and that's easy enough. We just add up all the moles, and we would see we have a total of 25 moles. The next step is to find the mole fraction of each of these gases. And again, we know how to find the mole fraction. You find the number of moles of the gas you're interested in and divide it by the total amount of moles. For example, the mole fraction of dinitrogen oxide is 0.2 because we have 5 moles of dinitrogen oxide and we have 25 moles in total, so that would give us a mole fraction of 0.2. The mole fraction of, ox of water is 0.48 because we see we have 12 moles of water and we have a total of 25 moles, so that gives us a mole fraction of 0.48. And the mole fraction of xenon is 0.32. Again, 8 moles of xenon, 25 moles 
of gas in total, that gives us a mole fraction of 0 0.32. And remember, the next step is to find the partial pressure of each gas. And again, we know how to find the partial pressure of each gas. You take the mole fraction of the gas you're interested in and multiply it by the total pressure, and that gives you the partial pressure of the gas you're interested in. For example, the partial pressure of dinitrogen oxide is 14 atmospheres. Because again, we have a mole fraction of 0 0.2, and we have a total pressure of 70 atmospheres, so that gives us the partial pressure of dinitrogen oxide. And we would use that same formula for each of these gases. And again, this makes sense. Now that we know the partial pressures of each gas, we realize this makes sense because we know if dinitrogen oxide contributes 20% of the moles in this gas, it makes sense that it would contribute 20% to the total pressure. 20% of 70 atmospheres is 14 atmospheres. So this is all pretty straightforward and logical. As long as you remember the actual identity of the gas is not important. And again, each gas is doing their own thing. If we were to magically make these two gases disappear, this dinitrogen oxide would still contribute 14 atmospheres. So this is referred to as Dalton's law of partial pressures. And the key idea is that each gas is doing their own thing. And once you find the, the mole fraction of a gas and multiply it by the total pressure of the gas, you find the partial pressure of that gas, which is essentially that gas's contribution to the total pressure. So let's say we have this nitrogen gas. And let's say this nitrogen gas has a partial pressure of 100 atmospheres. It makes sense that some of this nitrogen is going to dissolve in this water solution. So now you might wonder, what is the molarity of nitrogen in this water solution if we have this partial pressure of 100 atmospheres? Well, to determine this, we need to use Henry's Law. And Henry's Law essentially tells us the molarity of a gas in a solution equals the solubility constant multiplied by the partial pressure of the gas you're interested in. And something important to realize, this solubility constant is a function of the particular gas in that particular solution. For example, you would look in a chemistry textbook and see the solubility constant for nitrogen gas in water solution is 0.002 moles per atmosphere. So now solving this Henry's law, we know the solubility constant of nitrogen in water and we know the partial pressure of nitrogen. We saw the partial pressure of nitrogen was 100 atmospheres. So 100 atmospheres multiplied by the solubility constant from nitrogen in water would give us the molarity of nitrogen in this water solution. And we see that if we look at the units, we know partial pressures in units of atmospheres, which is just a unit of pressure. And we see the solubility constant has units molar over atmospheres. So we see that atmospheres will cancel and we're left with molar, the molarity. So it's a pretty straightforward equation. But let's try another example. Let's say we have the sulfur dioxide gas. And let's say we have a partial pressure of three atmospheres for all this sulfur dioxide gas. What is the molarity of sulfur dioxide in this water solution? Well, again, we just use Henry's Law. The molarity of the gas in that solution equals the solubility constant for that gas in that particular solution multiplied by the partial pressure of the gas you're interested in. So we would look in a textbook and see the solubility constant for sulfur dioxide in oxygen has a solubility constant of 11.2 molar per atmosphere. So knowing this, we know the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide is three atmospheres. We multiplied by the solubility constant. We see the atmospheres cancel and we're left with the molarity of the sulfur dioxide in this water solution. And we would get a molarity of 33.6 moles, moles per liter. So now we know the molarity of sulfur dioxide in this, in this, in this water solution. However, something important to realize is even though we had a much larger partial pressure of nitrogen relative to the sulfur dioxide, we had a much smaller molarity of this nitrogen relative to the sulfur dioxide. 
And this is maybe unintuitive because you would think if you had a larger partial pressure of a gas, that would result in a larger molarity. However, something important to realize is this solubility constant plays a large role in how much of that gas is actually dissolved in the water solution. And something important to realize is this solubility constant is a function of that gas in that particular solution. And we see this sulfur dioxide has a much larger solubility constant. And the reason why is because this sulfur dioxide is a very polar molecule. So therefore, because it's such a polar molecule, it makes sense that it's going to enjoy being dissolved in this polar water solution. They're going to form enthalpically favorable bonds, so it makes sense that this sulfur dioxide is going to like to dissolve in this water solution. And that's why, with such a small partial pressure, we're able to have such a large molarity. However, this nitrogen gas is very nonpolar. So therefore, it's, this nitrogen gas is not going to like to be in this polar water solution because nitrogen is very nonpolar, water is very polar, so therefore, they're not going to like to dissolve in each other. And that's reflected in the solubility constant. It has a very low solubility constant, which essentially tells us that nitrogen gas does not like to dissolve in water. And that's why we can have such a large partial pressure of nitrogen, yet such a small molarity and such a small amount of that nitrogen dissolving in this water solution. And also something important to realize is each gas is doing their own separate thing. These gases are not influencing one another. They're essentially invisible to one another. For example, we could make this nitrogen gas disappear and this three atmospheres of sulfur dioxide will still have a molarity of 33.6 molar. So it doesn't matter whether this nitrogen gas is around or if we get rid of this nitrogen gas, this nitrogen gas has no impact on the sulfur dioxide. This sulfur dioxide is doing its own separate thing. And when this nitrogen, di when this nitrogen is around, this sulfur dioxide is going to have a molarity of 33.6. However, we make this nitrogen gas disappear, the sulfur dioxide will still have a molarity of 33.6 molar. Every gas is doing their own thing. They're essentially invisible to one another and they do not influence one another. So to summarize, there are two factors that influence how much of a gas gets dissolved in a particular solution. There's the partial pressure of that gas and there's the solubility constant, which is a function of that particular gas in that particular solution. And that will tell you the molarity and the concentration of that gas that has been dissolved in that particular solution. For example, let's say we have three atmospheres partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide gas in this water solution. You might wonder how much of this sulfur dioxide gas will dissolve in this water solution. Well, again, we simply use Henry's law. So we have three atmospheres partial pressure, and we would look in a textbook and see the solubility constant for sulfur dioxide in water is 11.2 molar per atmospheres. So multiplying those, we would see we would have a molarity of 33.6 molar, which essentially tells us how much of that gas will dissolve in this water solution. However, what if we double the partial pressure? Well, if you double the partial pressure, you will double the amount of the sulfur dioxide dissolved in this water solution. So if we went from three atmospheres to six atmospheres, we would go from 33.6 molar to 67.2 molar. And again, we see that with Henry's law. Again, we double the partial pressure, so therefore we would double the molarity. However, something else that influences how much of a gas gets dissolved in the solution is the particular solution, because that particular solution will have a new solubility constant with that particular gas. For example, let's say we had this, this, this organic solvent so, so let's say we have three atmospheres partial pressure of sulfur dioxide in this organic solvent. Well, we would look in a textbook and we would find for this particular organic solvent, sulfur dioxide has a solubility constant of 0.1 molar per atmospheres. So therefore, even though we have the same three atmospheres partial pressure, we would have a much smaller molarity. We would only have a molarity of 0.3 molar. So therefore, a much smaller amount of the gas dissolved. And again, we can determine this using Henry's law. 
So the point is, there are two factors that determine how much of a gas gets dissolved in a particular solution. There's the solubility constant and there's the partial pressure. As you increase the partial pressure, you increase the amount of that gas that dissolves in the solution. And as you change this particular solvent, you essentially change the solubility constant, which will play a big role in how much of that gas gets dissolved. And that makes sense. That makes sense if you double the partial pressure, you will double the amount of that gas dissolved in that solution. For example, if we have three atmospheres partial pressure, we would have a certain amount of pressure of these gases dissolving in the solution. However, if you double the partial pressure, now that you have a higher partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide gas, it makes sense that more of this gas would dissolve in the solution. So we would have a larger molarity and a larger amount of the sulfur dioxide dissolved in this water solution. So that makes sense, it's logical. However, the other factor that influences how much of the gas gets dissolved in a solution is that particular solution. For example, let's imagine we have the sulfur dioxide gas above this acetone, organic solvent. How much of the sulfur dioxide will dissolve in this acetone solution? Well, you need to know the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide gas, and you would need to know the solubility constant for sulfur dioxide dissolving in this acetone organic solvent. So you would look in a textbook and see the solubility constant for sulfur dioxide in acetone is 0.1 molar per atmosphere. So now you take the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide and multiply it by the solubility constant, and that would give you the molarity. That will give you that will tell you how much of that sulfur dioxide dissolves in this acetone solution. And we would get a molarity of 0.3 molar. So we see in both of these examples, we had a partial pressure of three atmospheres. However, in this example, we had essentially 33.6 molar of that sulfur dioxide dissolving. But in this example, we only had 0.3 molar of the sulfur dioxide dissolving in this acetone organic solvent. So we see the, the solubility constant plays a huge impact on how much of that gas actually dissolves in that solvent. So the key point is when it comes to Henry's law, there are two variables that influence how much of the gas dissolves in a solution. There's the partial pressure. As you increase the partial pressure of a gas, you increase the amount of that gas that dissolves in that solution. And, and we saw that with this particular, with these two examples. However, there's also the solubility constant. As you increase the solubility constant, you increase the amount of gas that dissolves in the molarity. And we see that. We saw as you increase the solubility constant, you will increase the molarity. You would increase the amount of that gas that dissolves in the solution. So that's Henry's law.